to dismiss Penman. In 1882, the New York Times carried a headline, quote, The Hinman Liable Suit, Bishop Hare Testifying on His Own Behalf, More Allegations of Immorality on the Part of the Plaintiff, Love and Religion on the Frontier. <laughs> the salacious details of the accusations made, as well as the novelty of a priest suing a bishop, made enticing news copy. Major General Leitner, the U.S. Indian agent for Santee, for his own reasons, corroborated all of the charges against Hinman. In his mind, Hinman had gone to the other side in having relations with that Indian woman. However, when pressed, Leitner admitted that he had heard all the allegations secondhand from another agent. Nevertheless, in the end, the court decided in Hinman's favor. He was awarded $10,000. But the verdict was subsequently overturned on appeal. And in 1887, the priest and the bishop met in front of the presiding bishop of the church and signed papers that exonerated each the other from any wrongdoing. Like his Santee charges, Hinman felt compelled to acquiesce to the superior power of the MSEC. In spite of his dogged efforts to clear his name, he had to submit, lest he be unable to practice as a priest, something that for him was a matter of life and death. So what can this sort of drama of charges, countercharges, and lawsuits that in the end accomplished nothing tell us about the Civil War and Reconstruction in Dakota Country? Numerous historians have weighed in on the Hinman Hare scandal, but most have missed the broader significance. The struggle between the two men masked two fundamental structural changes taking place after the Civil War in Sioux Country. Hare played a unique role as a mediator between the federal government, the church, and the Sioux. This was the first structural change. Religious leaders, and bishops like Hare particularly, began to play a powerful and decisive part in formulating and enacting federal Indian policy in places where the government had only minimal control, like the Northern Plains. In a sense, church missions were ex officio governments, acting on behalf of the U.S. government, with tremendous influence and power. Though the aims of the two governments were not always the same, the larger goal of pacifying and, quote, civilizing the natives was a shared mission. Bishop Hare administered large sums of federal money spent in missions, and not just in Sioux country. For example, he met with the Secretary of the Interior in 1877 to discuss the status of a grant of money for a school at the Oneida Reservation in Wisconsin. The selection, vetting, and supervision of federal agents proved to be the centerpiece of the MSEC's and Hare's governmental role. The MSEC <coughs> formed a special committee on agencies to nominate and review the U.S. government agents in the field, and Hare was put in charge of that commission. Agents were confirmed or rejected on the strength of the recommendation from the Episcopal Church. On occasion, the government even apologized for taking charge of their own agents without consulting the MSEC. As an emissary and ruler of the shadow government that was the missionary district of Niobrara, Bishop Hare was constantly on the move between New York, Niobrara, and Washington. Hare worked with the Secretary of the Interior, and Hare's work with the Secretary of the Interior, pardon me, made him privy to and instrumental in enforcing policy changes coming from the Indian Service. Hare encouraged the forced removal of the Ponca tribe to Oklahoma, during which 400 Indians died. He proposed the disbandment of the reservations, which were, in his opinion, an impediment to white settlement and, quote, the progress of civilization. He joined the Quakers in promoting the allotment of Indian lands to individual Indian holders and extending U.S. citizenship over them, thereby making them subject to state laws and taxation. These steps became reality in the General Allotment Act, or Dawes Act, of 1887, that resulted in the devastating loss of two-thirds of Indian homelands, nearly 90 million acres. Hare hoped that by bringing about the sale of, quote, the remainder of the country to white settlers, the two races could be intermingled. Praising the, quote, many white men who have intermarried with the Indians, and who have been, quote, valuable helpers of Indian civilization and have nobly seconded missionary effort, Hare promoted miscegenation for white men as long as they were not priests like Hinman. To the bishop, 
Allotment entailed more than just selling off excess Indian lands. It meant promoting a eugenic campaign of whitening Indians by wresting control of women's bodies. The second structural change that took place under the auspices of Grant's peace policy was that the MSEC used its special status to attempt to attain freehold title to the Indian lands on which their missions resided, a violation of the U.S. Constitution. The question of land title at Santee enlarged to become a move throughout the MSEC to get free and clear ownership of all the lands that the Episcopal Church had been loaned by Native people. Before the removal of Hinman, the MSEC directed Hare to make claim and gain title from the U.S. government to the lands used by the Santee Mission. Such an act was proposed by Congress in 1874, but did not pass. This was not the first request for such legislation. Bishop Whipple wrote to Edward E. Smith, the director of the Department of Indian Affairs, asking, quote, If there is not a law by which you can convey to us the property on which our mission buildings stand, Whipple had a benefactor for his hospital, but could only secure the donation if the church could demonstrate a freehold title to their lands. In 1878, Bishop Hare employed the services of a lawyer, Frederick J. Fox, to investigate the title of the land and buildings on the Santee Agency around the time that he fired Hinman. He reported back to Hare that no claim had been filed by any Santee person or Hinman for the lands at the mission. He suggested that the church could invoke a, quote, squatter's right to take the land. Technically, Indian land could only become an actual commodity by having its title, quote, extinguished by a sale to the federal government or to an individual facilitated by the federal government. That is what the Constitution says. <coughs> Numerous preemption laws enabled settlers to argue, however, that they should have title to lands because they had improved them. The Sioux lands were placed in federal trust by the Treaty of 1868, but that did not quiet or dispel the efforts by the church and other squatters to attempt to expropriate them. In the special case of the Santees, and this is where I'm returning to my original uh, point about the Treaty of Fort Laramie, however, Hinman's intervention created a complicated but revealing land tenure puzzle. He used his special position in the 1868 treaty negotiations to enable the Santee to claim freehold ownership of their lands. But this clause also empowered him to claim title to the land the Asadi had allowed him to use for his mission. Hinman certainly believed that since he built the mission before it became official, he possessed its title. Amidst the prevalent influence of an expansionist land right culture that gave dominion to those who occupied and used land, both the Asadi and Hinman possessed a powerful claim to the lands they occupied a claim potentially more secure, in the end, in an era of squatting and preemption than the supposed trust protection provided by treaty that made Indian lands subject to the plenary power of Congress. And the case in point, obviously, is the Black Hills. This was treaty-protected land, and it did the Sioux no good because squatters were able to move in on the land. However, by the same token, Isadi could potentially permanently lose their lands more easily because of this special clause if they did not invoke their land right through occupation improvement and the courts in order to gain title. Hinman had, ha had to be got out of the way. The Santee had to be expelled from the mission, both things that happened. Only then could the MSEC use squatting and preemption to gain title to Isati lands. So, conflict between Hinman and Hare was in its way an enactment of the drama of the uncertain legal standing of Native Americans on their lands within the larger nation. By inserting that clause in the Fort Laramie Treaty, Hinman created an utter idiosyncrasy that caused his downfall and revealed the shared mission of the Episcopal Church and the federal government in the conquest of the Sioux. The Union, preserved from an act of rebellion and freed, at least legally, from the shame and contradiction of slavery, had still another block of its population residing on the land in an ambiguous manner. The trial of the priest only took place because he refused to get out of the way of this forward thrust of expansion, though he played a first and necessary step in its progress. 
Samuel Hinman was able to return to active ministry in Minnesota, but died suddenly of pneumonia on March 24, 1890, the day before the Feast of the Annunciation, nearly 12 years to the day that he had been informed of his dismissal by Bishop Hare. He was 51 years old. Bishop Hare died after long labors from a malignant facial growth at age 71 on November 23, 1909. The same year that Hinman died, on December 29, 1890, the Seventh Cavalry used, among other weapons, a Hotchkiss repeating rifle to murder between 146 and 200 Sioux people and 25 of its own soldiers in what has become known as the Wounded Knee Massacre. Episcopal missionaries from the Pine Ridge Agency, formerly known as Red Clouds Agency, possibly some I have told you about today, buried 20 of the Indians, the entire cadre of U.S. soldiers, and tended the wounded in the Pine Ridge Mission Church that had been greened for Christmas tide. The Sioux have never accepted the fraudulent sale of the Black Hills, have never taken the money. $350 million sits in a special government account testifying that the Sioux are still fighting their war. With nation building on the march, the individual injustices and miscarriages are often lost on the large stage from sea to shining sea. But I will close with a reminder that individual stories writ large are what we have come to regard as history. Reverend Henry St. George Young, a few days after serving at Hinman's presentment trial, wrote, I think I know more of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the depth of Satan, and the strength of inbred sin and the awful deceitfulness of the human heart, than it was possible for me otherwise to have known these things before.